This is Johnny Gould's Jewish State. More than once, Johnny Gould's Jewish State has circled back to a previous episode with startling new revelations. Back at episode 88, I sat down with my old friend Jonathan Friedland to discuss his latest best-selling book, The Escape Artist, about the young Jewish men who broke out of Auschwitz to warn the world of the horrors within. Their report reached the desks of Roosevelt, Churchill and the Pope, and they warned Hungary's Admiral Horty to stop the deportation of the country's Jews to Auschwitz. He was the regent of, of Hungary, the de facto ruler, and he had allowed, turned a blind eye to, the deportation of 437,000 Jews, more than that actually, from the Hungarian provinces. So, I, so Horty had no problem with handing the Jews of Hungary over to the Nazi occupiers in that spring of 1944. A 56-day killing spree, actually, that was the fastest, you know, it was the fastest period of Holocaust slaughter in the entire period. Horty doesn't bat an eyelid, you know, this is happening all around the country. Then, partly through their extraordinary escape, Verba and Wetzel have got the word out through this report, 32-page document, that makes its way through hand-to-hand, crossing borders, smuggled in the dead of night secretly. It gets out to different places and ultimately reaches Winston Churchill in London, Franklin Roosevelt in Washington, the Pope in Rome. And it makes it into the press, the world's press. It's only then, when the world's press now know about Auschwitz and what's happening there, thanks to Rudolf Verber and Fred Wetzel's escape, that the Pope, who's known about Auschwitz or longer than that, and Roosevelt, ditto, then write to Admiral Horty, Miklos Horty, and say, if you can continue with these deportations of Jews, and, unspoken, if you're on the losing side of the war, anyone involved, including you, will be held to account. At that point, Horty and the ruling circle in Hungary panic and think, we're going to be going to a war crimes trial. So let's he then you know, pulls the lever and demands at that moment halt the deportations halt the deportations it happens very quickly papal telegram privately doesn't Pope doesn't make it public Roosevelt say you've got to stop these deportations and Horty does that on July the 5th I think in uh, 1944 1944 and that moment 200,000 lives are saved but I never want to give him the credit no. to say he saved no. lives Verber and Wetzel say under duress, under pressure, under duress, under pressure, self-serving, yeah. saving his own skin. He finally stops conniving. Let's put it that way. Yes, he stops conniving in the in the slaughter of Europe, of Hungary's Jews. Doctor Bealevkovich is known to both of us. She's a fellow member of my synagogue, and one Shabbat morning, she told me that rather uniquely, she knew both men, Rudolf Verber and Alfred Wetzler who was her Uncle Fredo. But the contrasting post-war fortunes of the two men was stark. Rudy lived a metropolitan academic's life in Vancouver, but Fred was trapped behind the Iron Curtain in Czechoslovakia, constrained, ostracised, bullied by the repressive communist regime. Bayer is director of the Refugee Voices Testimony Archive of the Association of Jewish Refugees. She creates and archives Holocaust testimonies. And she's also a director of Sephardi Voices UK. Bea says she spoke to her Uncle Fredo in German, but an Austro-Hungarian German. She says it was special. And it really was. It was the accent of my own maternal grandparents who came from Vienna... A lovely melody, Bea describes it as. And she's right. This is my own grandma, Olga Pasana, who I spoke to on cassette in 1984. When Hitler came to, I was... You were 29, yeah. This was 1938 when Hitler came. Mm. And then I went... I was lucky to come to England on a, on a domestic permit. Mm-hmm. I went first from Vienna to... Budapest, 
Mm-hmm. And then I stayed for, I think, uh, three weeks. And then from there, I uh, on the plane to Prague for one day, from there to, to England. So here we are, Jonathan Friedland in conversation with Bea Lefkovich, the woman who knew both escape artists, Rudolf Werber and Alfred Wetzler. You and I first encountered each other back in June of 2022, and I was speaking at pretty well the very first event to launch the escape artist at JW3, the Jewish Cultural Centre in London. And... You slightly astonished me because when we had questions from the floor, and I think you may have been the first, you got to your feet and said that you knew Rudolf Werber, the man I've written this book, The Escape Artist, all about. And not only that, you also knew the man he escaped with, Alfred Wetzler. And I have met a few people who knew Rudy because I'd interviewed for in many sessions his teenage sweetheart and first wife, Goethe Verbova, but also his his widow, Robin Verber, and a whole lots of colleagues and others. But I hadn't really ever met anybody who had known Fred Wetzler. So just why don't you begin by telling me how you knew both of them? So obviously, I read that you're going to publish the book. So I was excited because I do think the story isn't well known and you've brought it out in the public. And I'd like to thank you for that. Um, and Thank also, you. of course, I have to say, I met them as a child. That's important because that <laughs> reflects the memories um, I have of them. Um, so, and it links to to my mother. So my mother uh, was Dr. Gertrude Friedman, and she survived the war in hiding in Jilina. She was taken under, they had, uh, there was an uncle called Armin Winter, uh, who was um, exempt from deportations. Uh, the Slovak government deported many, many Jews in 1942, but kept about 10,000 Jews in Slovakia who were economically important. And her uncle, Armin Winter, fell in that category. She didn't and her family, but that means they went to Zilina and he could help them and they stayed with him for about two years. There was still a Jewish community. So Zilina, we should say, is in Slovakia and yeah. it's, an, it's a provincial town in Slovakia and it would become quite important for reasons we might get onto in the Rudy story. Correct. So she was there. She was then 14-year-old, 15-year-old. She went to school in Jelena and to, surprisingly, um, you know, after the deportation stopped in 42, they were, you know, it was difficult, but there was a school, uh, there was a youth movement. So my mother in Jelena had actually an okay time. Uh, I have photos from that time. So how does it link now to uh, Verba Wetzler? So at some point, her uncle Armin said to her, there are two men in a specific place. Uh, I'd like you, Gertie, to bring food to them. And she took a can of, you know, food, which is stacked. Uh, there was food in there. And she went to the, um, it was the, the Jewish old age home in Jelina, uh, which actually today has a little museum for Verba Wetzler. Um, and, she took it and entered a room. And I know all this because actually we went to Jelena and she showed it to me. So I have an idea of the location. And she brought, she opened the door and there were these two men. She didn't know who they were. But what she did recall, that they looked at her and really couldn't believe it. They, you know, looked at each other and said, wow, there's still children alive. There is a child still here. Um, and that's what she recalled of that meeting. So this is your mother yeah. met Fred and Rudy in their hiding place after they'd yeah. made the escape. This was the place, the significance of this is this was the place where they poured out this information they had kept and memorised of the killings in Auschwitz, which would become the Verba Wetzler report. And I think they were in the basement of that old people's home because I visited that place yeah. myself. There is now a plaque. In fact, I was yes. there the day they unveiled the plaque. And uh, there are rooms in the basement where... That Rudy and Fred were kept because they were in hiding. Yes, so exactly. It is when they where they wrote this report um, and where they were in touch with the Jewish community. So I don't know how instrumental her uncle Armin was. In fact, I'm, I 
you know, I uh, my mother left the manuscript behind. She died two years ago. So I'm working on this manuscript and I want to do something with it. So that's part of it. Don't know what his function was, but the local Jewish community helped him, uh, help them. And of course, put them in touch, uh, you know, with the other officials. And, you know, there were then the interrogation and all that kind of thing that took place there. And the report was written there, which my mother didn't know anything about. She All she knew, there were these two men and she brought the food to them. And she was 14, you said? Yeah, she was born 1929. They escaped in April. So she was actually 15. She would have just turned 15. Just turned 15. I don't know exactly the date uh, we know when they were in Jilina. So from when to when were the were they in Jilina? They were there from the um the they crossed into Slovakia in twenty first of April, and they got right. to Jilina on the twenty fourth, and they were re- re- and the report was more or less done by about the twenty seventh, twenty eighth of yes. April. Um, yes. signed off on around then. So she would have just turned fifteen. And did she was she frightened of the I'm just thinking because they looked terrible. No, she didn't report it that way. Um, she reported it. She she didn't know. She listened to her uncle and she did, you know, she did what she was told. She, you think 15. So she just turned 15. Um, she looked small for her age. That I know that. And that's why she was used as a sort of courier in her family. She had an older sister who was 18 uh, and they had to protect the sister. Uh, because, you know, she was beautiful and she at- attracted attention. And my mother was a sort of boyish character, looked quite small. And that's why she was sort of used as a kind of courier, also in other circumstances. So that was her role uh, within the family of four. And important later when they escaped from, you know, Jilina and went into the mountains. But that's another story. Another story. Did she um, do this bring- bringing the food in those stacked metal containers? Did she do that more than once? No. she Just, just the it. one time? Okay. Just so, one time. So, so I don't know exactly who else brought the food. She knew the place and said we went there and uh, she was actually filmed by a film crew. They they reconstructed that scene. And at that time, we couldn't get into the basement. So we were in that building filming um, and they reconstructed it, you know, her coming into that room with the stacked containers um, and there are some rushes, you know, I, in, in Slovak. I don't, I, I haven't seen them. Uh, what she, her memory was really that of they, they couldn't believe it. Um, and then obviously she, you know, she wasn't in touch with them. Lost sight. Uh, they, they went along, went to Bratislava, joined the partisans, Rudy and, um, uh, and Freddie. And my mother's stories. They, you know, they then there was the uprising in Banska Bystrica, and they joined that uprising. Uh, her, my mother, her sister, and her parents, uh, and then fled to the mountains, and then had a interesting story of survival, and survived, and ended up uh, towards the end of the war in Zvolen. In an amazing story, uh, they they had false papers. They were lucky enough to have false papers, uh, and they survived in Zvolen, uh, renting a room uh, with, a, you know, with a Slovak family. And after some time, they had two SS officers who rented another room in the same building. And for months, they lived in that house together, pretending to be Slovak. Um, Extraordinary. And they knew, you know, that mm. during these SS officers would go and, you know, yeah. kill a, a lot of people. But anyway, that brings me back to the second part, um, because then after the war, uh, my mother's cousin married Freddie, Etta Betzler. So she married Freddie. Uh, and then obviously, you know, my mother got to know Freddie. Um, and what is interesting, then my mother got married in 1964 in Pieszczany, in one of the few Jewish post-war weddings. And Freddie was her witness uh, at her wedding. So I have his name is on her Ketuba on her wedding certificate, uh, which is interesting. And I have photos of him, of Etta and their daughter, Tanya, um, attending the wedding. And Etta herself, an Auschwitz survivor. An Auschwitz survivor. Um, you say in your book, you know, that, that Etta uh, was the cause of that sort of fallout. Well, in fairness, it was rather Rudy's feelings about Etta. It was, yes, Rudy was suspicious of Etta because he was suspicious 
of people who survived the uh, uh, Auschwitz. And that's a strange thing to say. But as someone who had been in Auschwitz, he always wondered what had this person done in order to survive. And so I don't think it was that Etta did something wrong or bad in the relationship between the three of them. It was merely, as I understand it, the yeah. fact that she had survived aroused Rudy's suspicion. Yes. I, I don't know. I don't know. And uh, I have. I was in Slovakia recently and spoke to somebody about that. And again, I think it's not clear. But it meant by amazing coincidence that your mother, having seen these two when she was just 15 and they were had just escaped, she then, one of them marries into her family, yes. which is an amazing coincidence. But I suppose the Slovak Jewish community was so small that things like that did happen, where people, cousins, knew other people, etc. It was a tiny community before the Holocaust, yes. let alone afterwards. It was a, We're talking in this just a few thousand people. Well, there were 80,000 Jews in Slovakia pre-war, so, you know, not so small. My mother came from Pieszczani, which had a very small, there were about 1,500 Jews in Pieszczani. Bratislava was a bigger community. Mm. Um, but yeah, she she was close to them because also I think she babysat the daughter. So I know she was close to the daughter. And the daughter later came to stay with us as well. Um, you know, so they had they had a close a close relationship. The best guests and their most heartfelt views. A relay of their missions to a worldwide audience. 100 episodes along, and I'm proud that it's fast become the podcast of record. This is coverage of the Jewish and Israeli world that just doesn't get properly aired in mass media. And I'm not ashamed to ask for your help. A one-off donation is always gratefully received to support my efforts, but a monthly donation really gets our service off the ground. Your donation can also be made with gift aid. And it's so easy to do. Just click on this. Donorbox.org slash JG podcast. That's Donorbox.org slash JG podcast. Are you in? Please share my series with your friends and thank you for listening. So let's bring it to when you met yeah. Fred, and then you'll tell me about meeting Rudy. Yeah, so um, I should say something about myself. So I grew up in, in Germany as a daughter of two survivors because my parents emigrated to Germany in the, in the 60s. My father actually in 58, my mother in 1964 after she married my father. Um, and that is to really escape from communism. They had a hard time my mother and, and my father. So they escaped and settled in Germany. So the interesting bit is I was always aware of the Holocaust. I knew my parents are survivors. They talked about it, not in detail. We certainly didn't talk to our friends, to our other Jewish friends in detail about our parents' experience. We all knew they are survivors. It wasn't a secret. But my mother had lots of friends who were survivors. So one of them was Rudy, and I'll tell you a little bit about how I met Rudy. And uh, of course, I knew about uh, Vetsa. I knew that they had escaped. I'd heard the story. So I was very, very lucky that I managed or decided that I would like to go to Bratislava. And in the winter of 88, uh, I decided I, you know, I should visit them. And I went with a friend to Bratislava and we stayed with them for about a week. Uh, in their flat in in Bratislava. And I have a, you know, a diary and I checked my, I just looked at my diary, I found my diary. And, you know, I say it was so interesting that they they still live in the world of Auschwitz. The world of Auschwitz is was still there. They talked about it. She talked about it. He talked about it. Um, they had a hard time because Fredo wrote that book. He had to write it in the third person. Uh, he had problems with the Communist Party. Uh, their, the money was cut because of... The, that's what they told me at the time. Because the report was sent to the papal nuncius, um, that was a problem in post-war Slovakia because they kind of said it was a religious... It, that it wasn't socialist. That they made this a problem for Freddie. Uh, and he lost his job. And as you know, he then ended up working in a library um, so 
What was the job he lost? I think he was a journalist. Yes, I, I, that's what I think too. When you wrote this very perceptive thing in your diary that they yeah. still live in the world of Auschwitz, how old were you then in that week when you spent time with them? I was 23, 1980. I'm just, I, I'm looking here. Look, this is my diary. I can show it to you. Ah, <laughs> your whole green exercise book. It's an exercise book. It's written, I, let me, I wrote the entry in January 88. Um, but I think we, it was a visit over, over New Year's. So it was probably the beginning of January 88. And right. 40 he, before he died. Yes, he died in 88, didn't he? Yeah. In I fact, think, I think somewhere I read that he died in 87, but this is proof that it was 88. It's proof he was, it was 88. I think it was uh, a month before he died because I write then that I was so, I feel so lucky that, that we visited them. He'd lost his job, which had been, you think, as a journalist. Yeah. And was now, when you were there, he was working in a library. You know, I can quote you here. Yes, please, I, yeah. It's a journey. This is a journey, a journey into history, into the history of my family. The concentration camp is part of daily life. Um, you know, the television is on in the background, but Freddie is talking about his escape. Etta is talking about the Kapos uh, in Auschwitz. The underlying yeah. gist is that it's so very present. Yeah. Uh, and they talk about, um, you know, their life um, in the camp. And, you know, they when they talk about other people, they talk about this one was in the camp, this one wasn't in the camp. So it was it was very very um very pr present what i do write about one other entry is that they are not uh, there's no hatred towards germans and i found that you know noticeable um that there is no no hatred what language did you speak with them in was it german german, german. yeah my entry i'm re i'm translating now when i'm reading this speech. but but the language you spoke to them in was german fred and yes. yes and i should say is their, their German was this wonderful um, Austro-Hungarian German. Ah. You know, there's a specific for me. It's the, my family. That's the sound I grew up with. It's German, but it's not. Freddie's German wasn't uh, flawless at all. Actually, I, for him, it it was not his first language for sure. Not because right. I listened to his. Um, you might have listened to that uh, interview transcript, interview recording, uh, in the Auschwitz process. Have you ever listened to it? It's painful because the judge was absolutely mean to him. And you can say he's struggling. He's struggling with the German. Right. Um, um, so it wasn't his, but but Etta's uh, German was excellent. So they all, my mother spoke German, you know, they grew up with German. But it's this specific, uh, wonderful Austro-Hungarian German, which is not Austrian German. It, it's a specific accent, you know. And does it sound quite archaic? It didn't, it didn't sound archaic to me. I grew up with it. You know? Right. But it has, just, a, lovely, it has you, a sort of lovely melody. Um, you said that Freddie talked about the escape. Do you remember what he said about it? I didn't discuss it. You know, I don't think we discussed it in that detail. He talked about here that he was excluded. He was accused of being a spy for the Pope, like, a, you know, uh, yeah. and that he was excluded from the party. I mean, that was a big thing, you know, to be excluded from the Communist Party. And that's big on the grounds that the report had been sent to the papal nuncio. Yes, that's what I gathered at the time. But, you know. And I'm, therefore, they, the authorities, the communist authorities tried to depict him as an agent of the Catholic Church. Correct. Yeah. This is according to my entry. You know, that's what he said. Um, uh, and that he, uh, more importantly, also that they, they got some reparations maybe there was some sort of pension from the czech government czechoslovak government for survivors or for partisans probably you know because he was a partisan as well and that that was cut the main thing i recall was really the auschwitz was everywhere it was there and i understood that he, that he was excluded um excluded partly from normal life let's say in Czechoslovakia so he had to take on that job and I even felt then that his story was not heard you know I think you know obviously you wrote the book you had so much material on Verba but you know Vetsa there isn't so much material so no. 
I know there's a film is being made now. People are trying to do all kinds of things. But some accounts speak of him in these, especially towards the end of his life. Yeah. You know, there is one uh, book that describes him as dying bitter, drunk and alone. Um, what was the impression you got of him in that? Yeah, in that so, book? you know, I read that in your book and, you know, I have to say I found it, of course, disturbing because I knew him. I don't think that was not my impression. And when I was in Slovakia, uh, I went to a conference recently, I gave a paper um, and I talked to people who knew him. And that was not, I, I asked specifically about the alcohol because I never heard that. Uh, and that nobody could corroborate that. Mm. So I don't think that's true, um, that the alcohol aspect. Bitter, you know, sure, there was a certain amount of bitterness. But I think my impression is not only that, you know. I think, you know, they were very proud of their daughter, uh, Tanya. She was a doctor. She was very successful. Sadly, she died some years ago. So that's another reason why this story, why, you know, sh she would have a lot of information. Sadly, I didn't interview her. I don't think anyone interviewed her. It would be really interesting to grow up with, you know, with this, with the, with parents like that. They were very, but they were close to her. They were proud of her. She traveled quite a bit. She came to stay with us in Germany. Tanya, she had, she was a doctor. She worked also in Vienna, you know, so there was that aspect. I know their, their house was a meeting place for many other people. They're flat even mm. now talk about it so that this that i never the alcoholism i think as i said i don't know there is that one source i don't know who that source is but that i didn't know about it the, in the family nobody ever spoke about that yeah it appears in the book by um ruth lynn um, okay. es escaping auschwitz but those are the words right. she that appear in that book and, and when i said bitter partly again and this is in my book there is this suggestion yeah. that there was real tension between the two of them Verber and Wetzler for reasons I describe in the book but also that there was particularly on Fred's part for Alfred Wetzler that he resented what I would consider the rather small amount of attention that Verber got but it was more than he got and therefore can you tell me what if, if you picked up anything about that yes sure there was that the issue you know that uh there was a, you know something happened between them um and I think Fredo felt that um when Verba talked, he excluded him. I mean, I think, you know, that was a very strong feeling. And I think in that book, uh, which I, I, I think on Fredo's part, he felt he didn't exclude Verba, but that Verba excluded Freddy from his story. Or you call, on you call him Fredo sometimes. Fredo, yeah. We call him Fredo. Yeah. yeah but he, he felt he always was careful to recognize Verba, yeah. but Verba did not return the compliment, as it were. I think so. And, you know, it relates to the fact that the question is obviously, you know, and that is a big question, who had the initiative, um, who planned this, you know, who was who in that. And my interview with uh, Geta Verba, I asked her about this, and she said, oh, they were friends, and they planned this together, and they knew each other from Trnava. Um, But, you know, I was in Slovakia recently, and I asked this question, and that f there's a filmmaker, Robert Kirchhoff, and he told me, and he's done lots of research. So he said, and I don't know whether you heard that story, uh, that this, when the escape was planned, uh, that it wasn't Vrba who was to be the second candidate. It was somebody else. Something happened, and then Vrba took the place of the other person. So it was always to be Freddy uh, and then a second person. Yeah, R R Rudy was really emphatic that this was not true. He knew this version of events was out there. He addressed it. I mean, this was the view that this had been planned by the underground and they, the underground chose who was going to go. And uh, Rudy said that there was, quote, no mythical committee in Auschwitz, unquote, that decided these things. So, but the, but the, the, you're absolutely right. These the, these two different versions of the story are out there. Jonathan, it's not my source. It's no. that who's talked to a lot of people. So that's what he says. Yes. I, I I have to do more research on this. No, one. Sure. Um, but yeah. I think that was the, uh, the cause of it. The cause really, I think, according to, to Freddie was that, you know, I think they felt excluded. And also they felt, you know, he had more powerful tools at his hands because he was in the West. He was a university professor. He spoke English. Um, and of course that wasn't available, you know, to, to Freddie. So, um, and that brings me now to Ferber, who was a friend of my mother. So him, we visited in Canada. I was about nine or 10 years old. We had a wonderful time with him and Robin. 
Um, and I remember him, you know, he was glamorous. He was a very good speaker. He, you know, he, he liked my mother. My mother was close to, to, to them and we had a wonderful time in, um, in Vancouver. But at that time, obviously I didn't understand any, anything. I was, I was too young. Um, he then also came to visit us in France. Um, and again, I remember sitting with him in a cafe in his sort of, he was had a very dapper white linen suit and he was wearing a sort of hat. And, you know, he was that sort of very, yeah, he, with a lot of joie de vivre and enjoying his coffee. That's what I remember. But, you know, recollections of a 10 year old. How, how come um, they were friends? How do, how come they were in touch at all, your mother and him? I think they all studied together. Uh, my mother studied uh, in the 50s. She studied medicine and then dentistry. And Rudy was in Prague and Gata Vrbova, they were all in Prague together. So I think she knew him from Prague. Right. It wasn't that I, what I was expecting you to say was that somehow they she attracted him down because of that moment in Gilina with bringing the food. But no, they actually knew each other in a yeah. way separate from that by yeah. meeting in that small Jewish world in Prague post-war. Correct. I think at that time, you know, in the 50s, they were not thinking of the past. They were thinking of the future. They were studying. They were young. You know, they were in Prague together for three or four years. And she knew, she recalled also Gerta Vrbova. They met later here in London uh, and they knew each other. My mother's called Gerta as well. So Yes. Um, can you describe very powerfully that in, in being around Freddie and Etta, Auschwitz was present all the time. Yeah. I know your impression, then you were 23, but your impressions as a 10-year-old of Rudy, did it feel that Auschwitz was around all the time with him or maybe you were too young to tell no, it, it, certainly not. I was young, but also, you know, my impressions, we were in Canada. It was all exciting. I remember Vancouver. It was beautiful. Um, you know, Robin, his glamorous young wife. No, it, that was not, uh, I, I don't recall any any conversations. But again, I was young. Then later when he came to visit us in, in France, there were also, the, my mother was also in touch with the other, there were two other escapees. Uh, and I know my mother was in touch with them as well. And I remember one visit to, I think it was Mordovich. Wow. Uh, you know, so it was a close, you know, a small, as you said, it was close knit community and, and, uh, it was important for people to be in touch. Did you, did you, um, meet him again after being 10 years old? We had some sort of meeting in South of France and I think maybe even in Germany, he came to visit us. So, you know, we were in touch and I saw Robin. Uh, my mother, we went to, you know, there's this verb of it's the march. Yes. And my mother went a few years ago. We met the people in Gilina in the synagogue and Robin was there. Yes. So that's the last time we saw Robin. But your impressions of Rudy were the impressions of a child because you were young. in, in I mean, yes. Maybe a teenager in, in France or whatever, but you yeah. saw him. You, yeah. you that, that little pen portrait you could sketch there of glamour mm. and dapper and the linen suit just give me an impression of because we we didn't do that of 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 what kind of man freddie was i mean we talked about the atmosphere in the apartment but yeah can you sketch for, him, for me what he was like well you know it's sort of such a contrast to this vancouver thing it's the you know again i can't maybe i have some photos somewhere it was the flat i remember the sort of rather darkish gray i mean bratislava was gray the first one, when, when I arrived in Bratislava, we didn't stay with them immediately. We stayed in Petrozalska, which is a sort of, you know, communist high rises built, horrible, gray. I mean, it was gray. Everything was gray at that time in Bratislava. And that was also, I found, you know, that was my, my memories is dark and gray. And I mean, Freddie had a wonderful, lovely face, actually. Uh, I remember him fondly and he was a very gentle man gentle gentle soul uh quite softly spoken you know but the whole thing it was it was winter it was cold you know it was gray so those quite are my oppressive words. atmosphere if you're the way you're describing it oppressive i don't know i don't know i mean as i said it was you know the and i've interviewed so many survivors since so i know you know the uh survivors the the chronology of time isn't that auschwitz is there the trauma is there and that's exactly what it was but superficially yeah. you would think and I, and I know this is superficial but 
in a way, the presence of Auschwitz feels more obvious superficially in the Fred Wetzler yeah. case than Rudy, because Rudy's dashing and glamorous yeah. and full of life. And in these colourful places, Vancouver and uh, visiting yeah. you in cafes and everything, whereas what you're describing is quite a heavy, grey, drab context that Fred was in in those last years. For sure. And difficult, you know, they had a difficult, he, he wasn't, he felt he wasn't hurt. I think financially, probably it wasn't easy for them to be in communist Bratislava. That wasn't easy either. You know, mm. so I think the circumstances were much more difficult. Now, you've given yeah, me a so very good was... sketch of both of both men, actually. Freddie, on the one hand, his, his situation was difficult, but... He wasn't angry. So, you know, I write explicitly that there was, they were not angry with the Germans. I should also say that while Freddie was a quiet, Etta was very, you know, she was fun and loud and talked a lot. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of, I don't know whether Freddie smoked, Etta, they, they smoked. So the house was also f quite uh, heavy, <laughs> loaded with cigarettes. Um, you know, so, it wasn't, well, it was, you know, Bratislava was grey and the flat, there were lots of people also coming in. I remember there were, they had lots of visitors. There was a lot of talking. As I said, particularly Etta, she was a language teacher, so she had students also coming um, to the flat. And and she was um, talkative. It was he, Fred, that was quieter. Yeah. And as you say, sort of gentle and quiet. Yes, yes. Yeah. And do you know what, it would, was it clear to everyone that he was dying at the time or not? I don't think so. I just found my entry now. And I wrote on the 8th of February, 88, that he passed away one month after our return. And I'm so happy that, that I managed to see him. And I said, otherwise, for me, this would have been only a name, a silhouette, a shadow. So, you know, I, I realized that, that was important, you know, for history, probably, but also for, for our for our family. I didn't know at the time that he actually was my mother's witness at the wedding. Yeah. I just found recently the, you know, the document. Your diary is very poetically written. <laughs> yeah, well, interestingly, uh, you know, I, I was interested in history. You know, I studied history at uh, university, so maybe by 23, I, you know, I... Yeah, I was I was probably interested in that aspect as well. So when you saw Fred, did he ask about Rudy because you had seen him too? Was he interested in hearing what you had to say about him? Because he hadn't probably hadn't seen him for years and years. You know, I don't know whether we actually even asked what happened there. I don't recall that. No. Uh, it's, um, it must have been a very sad thing for them, you know. I can imagine. You know, and probably they felt sort of powerless to do something about it. And I know that in Slovakia, people feel, you know, here's the sort of Slovak story, some of you stayed and did it, and, you know, that story needs to be told. And, you know, I was recently, as I said, at the conference in Slovakia, I gave a paper about the story of, in our archive, Refugee Voices, we have the story of four Slovak women. One of them is my mother, two others. And weirdly enough, out of the four, three are linked to Verba Wetzler. So my mother who brought them the thing and later then Gata Verbova, because she was married to Rudy. And then um, another a third one uh, came out in the Kastner transport. So the Kastner story is, of course, linked of course. to the Verba Vesla report. Of so course. it's interesting. And the fourth one is um, uh, somebody who left uh, as a young child from Bratislava. Um, you know, so it's a refugee story. So yeah. anyway. You mentioned, which is fantastic, that Rudy and Fred couldn't believe that a child was still alive. And that was a very strong impression your mother got. How did that disbelief express itself? She, They said it to each other. One said to another, it's, it's unbelievable. I mean, you have to think, they spent two years in Auschwitz. And if you think about, I think that makes this Slovak Jewish situation so incredible. And I can say that from looking at my mother's personal archive, that within a distance of 112 miles, or you know, whatever the distance is from let's say Jelina to Auschwitz, and Jelina was a that you had Jews being incarcerated and killed in camps. And on the other hand, you had people who was there was still an official 
you know, Jewish community. My uncle Armin Winter was there as Armin Winter. My mother, they had false names uh, and false identities, but actually Jillian, I'm not sure they used it. They used it later in their survival. And they, they had a youth movement, you know, a Jewish youth movement. So that reality of that Slovak Jewish history, that is really interesting. Back to the uprising. Yeah. You know, uh, the Slovak uprising, which happened in August um, 1944 and lasted about two months before the Germans came and quashed it, that was, unfortunately for the Jews, a tragedy because then all the remaining Jews, most of them, were killed mm. but or deported then. Mm. You know, and very few survived. But until 1944, there were still, according to what I know, about 10,000 Jews um, in Slovakia. In that moment you describe, it wasn't that they were speaking to her. They were saying, noting to each other, Rudy to Fred, yeah. Fred to Rudy. It's unbelievable that a child is still alive here, just, yeah. as you say, 100 odd miles away from the pits of hell in Auschwitz. It's yeah. sort of an incredible thing. Yeah, and yeah. and that my mom looked younger than fifteen, so they, they yes. thought she's a, a young child, and yes. uh, they they just they they couldn't believe it. And their yes. reality, obviously, you know, from Auschwitz to coming to Jelina, where they must have met I don't know who else they met other Jews who were yeah. free, not you know freeish. Yeah. So yeah, that that must have been uh, you know for them mind blowing, really. Quite something. Before we leave this then yeah. and wrap it up, as I said at the start, you're one of the very few people who met both of them. Admittedly, you met one when you were not much yeah. more than a child. You met the other as a very young woman, but perceptive and 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 writer of uh, 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 of a diary. Is there anything in your that you've left out yet, or still to say about these two men? Your impressions of them, the story of them. I'm doing some more research. I'm I'm very keen to find out more about Wetzler, uh, that I can, you know, have more details uh, to get a fuller picture. But also I think, you know, and that's something I wanted to talk to you about is, is how, you know, whether you think there could be some more recognition. And, you know, there's this whole issue of Jewish saviors, you know, how can Jewish saviors be recognized? And mm. I think they did was very courageous. You know, it doesn't matter how many people they saved or not, they did save. A lot of people yeah so i would be very interested maybe to to think with you you know what we can do you know that maybe they could gain some official recognition yes some... i know i look i think very much the purpose of me writing the escape artist was for rudy's part of the story to at least get recognition uh and to bring his name to people who haven't heard it and i think it is bit by bit doing that I think it would be wonderful. I really hope a Slovak writer will do that for the store or a Slovak speaking writer, and maybe mm. that's you, will do that for Fred Wetzler. Um, but the, because the, the problem I encountered and the reason why it was impossible to write a, a book about both of them is, uh, as you said, because Fred didn't speak English and because also that terribly tragic fate, which actually befell both of them, of their children not living long, Fred and Rudy it meant there yes. weren't people around really for me uh, that there was just not the wealth of documentary evidence there was for Rudy and um, and you mentioned earlier the problem of the memoir I mean that Rudy was able to write a memoir and uh, as non-fiction in his own name uh, and with that degree of clarity and Fred because of the pressures that you've described in communist era Czechoslovakia had to disguise it as a novel under a pseudonym which just meant it was not really a reliable, well, not reliable is the wrong word, but it, it wasn't a, a source I could lean on for a non-fiction book. Yeah. I understand your limitations in that way. And uh, that's why I'm sure that I have heard now that there is a lengthy interview with Wetzler somewhere. So it would be really interesting to get hold of it. Um, I, th I think I know what you mean there. And I, I came across a filmmaker in Slovakia who has those tapes, those, and it was a long, many hours of interview that was filmed, As I'm, if we're talking about the same thing. Again, I think it was in Slovak, and I approached the filmmaker essentially to say, well, look, would you let me have access to these? Um, and I think he was feeling that he wanted to make his film first, but the trouble is he um, 
that's proved to be a very long process. I think that film has been years, if not maybe more than 10 years in the making. And I think the filmmaker is keen to do something that is won't be a straight sort of linear documentary, but something more kind of artistic. And therefore, um, it's so that also was something of a roadblock I hit there as well. Um, but I think there will, this is a task for, a, I think, a Slovak writer. I think it'd be yeah. wonderful if someone takes it on. I was at this conference at the, you know, that uh, Museum of the National Uprising in Banska Bystrica. And, you know, I think there is more interest in Jewish history. And obviously that's a, a, a proud part of, of the Slovak Jewish history is, is this escape story. So I think, you know, people are proud of it and there should be more information. My Slovak isn't, I speak a bit of Slovak, but um, isn't good enough to do that. But as you said, I think hopefully there will be somebody who can find more sources to sort of rehabilitate or to bring that voice out. Uh, because I do feel it's a sort of silenced voice. In, in hindsight, I should have sat down. You know, I, I'm an oral historian, uh, but I started it just slightly, slightly later when I was 24, 25. Um, now I think, why didn't I sit down? You know, I had the language. He's, you know, I could have just done a an interview, um, but, you know, I didn't. And no and it is one of the great regrets i mean he did do the filmed interview we've heard about he did do this interview with the state museum of auschwitz in 1963 which was very useful for me it was a very useful source but it wasn't you know it was 60 years ago it wasn't done in the way we would now do an interview i mean it was very it was quite brief whereas now you know it would be i mean a story like he had to tell you really wanted somebody to sit down and interview him for three or four hours yeah. and get it all down in the way that Claude Landsman did with Rudolf Verber. Yeah. Um, Bea, thank you very much okay. for this. I think we've... Um, we've well, we've, nice we've, to talk to you. It's wonderful to talk to you. I think we've got an insight into both men, and I'm grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Johnny Gould's Jewish State is brought to you with Dangor Education.